You're listening to the Bug Tyler Show with Brad Joseph on Chop Radio 102.7 FM New Market. Welcome to the Out and About Town Show on Chop FM 102.7. Today's guest is the one, the only, History Hound, a.k.a. Richard McLeod. Welcome to the studio, Richard. How you doing, Brad? Well, it's been, uh, we were just talking off the mic, it's been, what, three years since you've been in the studio? Yeah, I guess it's been three years we've been, we've been assigned uh, online uh, for the past while. How do you feel about doing online interviews other than face-to-face? Is there a difference? To you, do you think? Or? Well, I enjoy uh, doing them face to face. It's mm-hmm. it's it's nice to see the person that you're talking to, uh, as opposed to talking to a screen. I've done several person to person. I do a couple of, of uh, other gigs, so to speak, and mm-hmm. uh, and they've been person to person. So a lot of difference, you said, is you can read the body language and and look at the host and say, "Don't ask me that question." Uh, well, I would never do that to you. <laughs> Brad, but uh, no, it's it's interesting. There is certainly something uh, about being person to person. And again, you know, you made a very good point. Uh, we as humans are quite uh, attuned to the body language and the facial expressions of the people that we're talking to. And if you can't see that quite often, um, it's not as an enriching uh, conversation. Well, one of the great articles that you wrote, you talk a lot about old-fashioned conversations in the world of di- digital technology. Do you think this whole art of uh, old-fashioned conversation has sort of gone away the dinosaur? I do, and I think that uh, the research sort of backs up that that uh, that idea. Uh, what's happened is that uh, you know when you're online, you know we talked before, uh, your body gets out of practice in in reading uh, body language, facial expression. Uh, and if you take a lot, if you watch people talking now, uh, you'll notice that they, they don't, don't even, in most cases, look at each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an experience to, to be sitting someplace where there's a group of, uh, of young people uh, and they are texting each other. This is how yeah. they are having their conversation. And they're right across the uh, uh, Right across table. the table from each other or, or in the same room. Uh, you know, one of the things that I really miss is the... the the opportunity to have a, a a discussion with people on a whole wide range of, of topics and uh, and be able to uh, to learn and also to express how you feel about things to others in well, an since, unjudgmental way. Well, since we're speaking in Pickering College, which is a school, in case the listeners don't know, there there is there isn't too much I see too much digital technology yet, and there are teachers in the room actually teaching the people. And they seem to absorb a lot more energy and a lot more thought when the students are actually face to face with one of the teachers. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. Uh, you know, studies have, have actually shown that that is that is the case. Uh, you know, in, in the article that you referred to, I, I uh, talked about the fact that uh, if you take a child roughly f- five to seven days off uh, uh, social media. Uh, and uh, have them just talk to people. After about five to seven days, they their natural instinct of, of reading body language and facial expressive and actually listening uh, to the person uh, will be enhanced. Uh, so there's no doubt that uh, that technology has taken the the place of uh, mm-hmm. good old fashioned conversations. Now, in your previous life, didn't you didn't you have something to do in your business with teaching people and the coordination and learning the business world? Well, yes. Uh, a, a large part of uh, the curriculum that you know I was involved with was was learning how to communicate. Uh, now that was in a business context uh, where it's extremely important that uh, you know that you that you can communicate. But I would uh, I would venture to say that uh, in life it's it's very important. Uh, you really, the only way that anybody can get to know you is is through what you say, what you write, I suppose. And so communication is very important as well. You know, we're talking about history or history is the undercurrent of what we talk about every month. Uh, the preservation of our, uh, of our local history uh, falls down to, to oral history. Uh, it's a conversation of people uh, talking about what they remember about the town, what they remember about the world, uh, people finding out uh, who they are, mm-hmm. um, what they believe in. I think that's very important. 
Well, when I looked at more of your articles, a very, another very interesting article that caught my eye was about the, the brewery industry in Newmarket. And there's a lot of conversations in bars and restaurants and everything like that. But the brewery, the brewery industry was very predominant. What were the early stages of the brewery right here in Newmarket? Well, our first uh, brewery was over where the co-op uh, station was on, uh, I guess, just off Davis Drive by the, the train station. Um, but we've had enough, a number of breweries here. Um, the article was really the second stage in, uh, in my initial article, which was about the fact that Newmarket was, uh, went through a period where uh, a lot of people drank here. Um, so much so that uh, the Temperance League was extremely strong here, and uh, and we had prohibition for you know for a long time. We couldn't uh, buy alcohol here in Newmarket until 1954. So from the late 1890s to 1954, uh, you couldn't buy uh, alcohol legally here. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, well, Bradford was not included in prohibitions. So that's one of the reasons why on a Friday you could watch people in, get in their cars and a long line of people going up to, to Bradford to the tavern. Or, uh, of course, the, uh, the people in, in Hall Landing who were actually making the alcohol, selling yeah. illegal uh, uh, alcohol, the bootleggers. So, uh, but yes, Newmarket predominantly had one of the highest uh, uh, consumption rates of all of Canada, um, you know, back in the good old days, uh, and it was a real problem. I, you know, I recommend to people who are interested in the topic that they, they read my article on Prohibition. I think you'll be quite surprised at the fact that uh, uh, Prohibition was so strong here, you know, lasted for so long, but also uh, the, the issue of alcohol abuse here in, in Newmarket. Uh, back then, most people made uh, their own alcohol, usually a malt, uh, you know, a beer, a malt, uh, but, uh, you know, everybody had it. Uh, life was tough, uh, so I guess, you know, you drank to forget. Yeah. But Friday and Saturday nights here, uh, you know, the, the, the wife and the children would get into the, to the buggy and come to Newmarket and uh, to try and find their husbands who quite likely had passed out face down on, yeah. on Main Street, and uh, it was an issue. And to me, Newmarket is still in some sort of provision with all the marijuana shops that are opening up in Aurora and York region, Newmarket's could sort of stayed off that path and it's more dry here and you have to, in order to get any kind of marijuana or medical or medicinal or personal marijuana, you don't have very far to go to Aurora, but it's a good thing that Newmarket sort of uh, stood its ground and didn't introduce any of the marijuana shops right here in town. Well, I was very fortunate, uh, Brad. I, uh, very early in the conversation, uh, I had somebody step forward and, and asked me if I wanted to make a bet. I had said that, uh, that there was no chance that Newmarket would, uh, would ever agree to uh, have uh, outlets here in Newmarket. And I based that primarily on uh, our uh, experience with alcohol. Um, but if you take a look across the gambit, Newmarket is, is quite a, a, a conservative uh, community and really always has been, uh, Brad. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's at all surprising. And of course, you know, we're sitting at Pickering, and Pickering is a uh, educational, educational system uh, that was initially created by the, the Friends or the Quakers. Um, this uh, particular community was established by the, the Friends or the Quakers, and uh, so they have a, there's this underlying uh, morality, I guess you would say, that I, I think I would argue still uh, permeates the uh, you know the community today. I think I caught you in a previous conversation that we were having. You, you mentioned something about the Temperance League. Am I correct in saying yes. that? Yes. What exactly was that? Well, uh, you know, most people. It's funny. Most people, you know, talk about the Temperance League, and they have this vision uh, from movies and from television of uh, all these irate women who were uh, who were busy taking all the fun out of men's lives. Uh, in reality, uh, yes, uh, they were uh, predominantly women, but uh, whenever women join together for a cause, uh, usually their men, their husbands, uh, are uh, attracted uh, to the organization. Uh, what was unique about Newmarket was that, uh, you know, the people who were who were the, the movers and shakers in the Temperance League. The official name is the Women's uh, uh, Temperance League. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian women, I guess I should 
emphasize Christian women's uh, temperance league, uh, but the uh, these women were the uh, wives of, you know, the mayor, the deputy mayor, the councillors, uh, many of the uh, the church leaders, and also the uh, business leaders. So, because of that, every time that uh, you know the council would consider uh, lifting prohibition, I guess the wives would have a little chat, private chat with their. Uh, uh, their husbands and uh, and they would vote against uh, lifting the prohibition. So, very powerful organization. Uh, a lot of people may remember, if you're a longtime uh, uh, habitant of Newmarket, a fountain that used to be at the corner of Park and Main Street in front of the Trinity United Church. Uh, there was a fountain there. That uh, fountain was, in fact, uh, uh, put in there by the Temperance League. Uh, to remind people uh, that uh, water was much better for you than alcohol, um, and it, it, you know, it was taken down, I believe, in 1955, but um, but it was very prevalent that there was a spot for dogs to drink and for people to drink and for horses to drink. It was kind of a, an interesting uh, arrangement. And the Temperance League isn't around today, is it? Uh, the Temperance League is still around. Still yes, around. they're still very strong, and they still are uh, are. Uh, They've taken on as well, uh, you know, what they consider to be illicit drugs as, as well. Um, but they don't have the power that they once did. Uh, although, um, you know, you mentioned about Newmarket not uh, adopting uh, or allowing the, uh, you know, the outlets, the, the, the marijuana outlets right. uh, into Newmarket. Uh, when that question, uh, you know, came before council, um, there were very strong uh, deputations from local citizens against, um, mm -hmm. you know, allowing it. So uh, I would I would argue that they're still there, still very much in business. I don't think, as I say, that they are as strong as they were back then. But then again, I think uh, the general attitude towards alcohol uh, has changed. You know, it, it always boggles my mind that we really don't have a problem with alcohol. I mean, we don't consider right. that we have a problem with alcohol, but for all those years, uh, you know, we, we felt that uh, marijuana was, uh, you know, an evil, evil substance that was going to drive you insane. Well, this is where on the, the, the topic of marijuana and uh, alcohol. Wasn't alcohol a necessity for the early new, th uh, new market settlers? Was it a necessity drink? Like well, milk? you know, one of the things that you have to understand, Brad, was that uh, Newmarket had a real problem with uh, a waterborne um, disease. You know, typhoid, uh, cholera, uh, diphtheria. Uh, you know, we had uh, you know all kinds of instances of, uh, of a lot of people dying locally. So one of the reasons why the early uh, settlers uh, took to making their own beer was that beer had to be cooked or had to be heated and you know even though I, I'm not sure that they completely understood the connection between the uh, the heating of, uh, of the the mixture and uh, the safety um, I think they they did realize that uh, beer was far less likely to make you sick than the water you know you have to keep in mind uh, that most people uh, beside their uh, their water well in the backyard would have a septic tank, yeah. or would have some some form of uh, of, uh, of sewage, uh, and they really, I guess, didn't connect the two and, and feel that it was unhealthy to be taking your your water from a well that was beside a septic tank. It just goes to show me that the the recent articles that are on now about the dangers of too much alcohol. They're coming uh, with new new findings all of a sudden. All of a sudden, they seem to wake up that the alcohol is bad for you. No well, commercials. you know, call me a skeptic, but uh, this I see is pretty much the same thing as eggs. Uh, I can remember a time when we were only supposed to have a couple of eggs a week because the eggs yeah. were bad for you and we were all going to die of heart attacks. And now um, the government uh, actually encourages you to eat eggs because they're very good for you. So, you know, I get a little bit uh, skeptical when the government changes the, you know, their opinion on, yeah. on, on these things. On that note, Richard will be right back, and we're going to talk a little bit about a favorite person that I uh, that I looked up on your article is John Dawson.
Okay. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about John Dawson and what he did for the community. Terrific. You're listening to Out and About Town Show on Chop FM 102.7. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I wish I followed the smoke out the window Instead of chasing down freedom in my debt Money Carlo Spent my money as fast as I could go Didn't have to think about paying rent tomorrow Twenty bucks on the dash only Hit the gas, said I can have it if I can reach it Now it feels like a memory I borrowed just chasing down freedom in my debt, money car. Sometimes that voice in my head sounds just like radio silence. In the back of my mind, you're always sitting there smiling.
and the bus goes Monte Carlo Relax crossroads when there's nobody to follow Pray for salvation and you beg for survival In space or on stage we would dream about Apollo Dreams don't last forever It's a bit of hill to swallow Twenty bucks on the dash, yo, and hit the gas, and I can have it if I can reach it. Oh, I got my heart broke, Monte Carlo. I wanted to be rich, cause we were sober. Thought that we'd be famous, we were on. Tell me where the sound goes, where the bars go. Welcome back to Chop FM 102.7 and the Out and About Town Show. With us in the studio is the one, the only, History Hound. Welcome back, Richard. How you doing, Brad? Well, when they meet you on the street, do they call you Richard or do they call you History Hound? Because I, because I really like a, I, I, I have a toque that has your name on it. Some people kind of look at me kind of different when I'm on Newmarket Main Street. Yeah, you've got to be careful. Uh, it's probably a dangerous practice <laughs> to have uh, my name on your forehead. Uh, <laughs> Actually, you know, the funny thing, and I think I probably mentioned this in a previous uh, uh, interview, uh, I initially had no intention of letting people know my name. Mm. So I created this History Hound uh, moniker to, uh, to do all of these things. But, uh, you want to be like, a, like anonymous? Well, I thought it, it, it probably uh, best. And I think, too, uh, you know, from the point of view of... Uh, of what I wanted to do or what I wanted to accomplish, I thought that just being a history hound was probably a good idea. Well, that's why you're sitting here and, and I'm asking you a question, because you are the history hound. Yeah, I guess this is what it is. It's worked. <laughs> well, well, before we went to break, I was mentioning a little bit more about a person that caught my eye in one of your articles, John Dawson, who was a compounding doctor. Was he, was he, was he, uh, was he here in Newmarket, John Dawson? Yes, uh, he uh, uh, came from England. Uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, an established doctor in England. Uh, he emigrated over here to to uh, to Canada. Uh, um, ended up uh, on Young Street, uh, just north of uh, of Davis Drive, on the uh, west side. Uh, his house, you know, we were we were uh, talking about the fact that his house was. Uh, one of two houses that were moved uh, behind Staples, mm -hmm. uh, so it's still there, uh, still looks, uh, uh, you know, pretty good. Uh, but again, you know, he's an interesting guy because uh, when he came here, uh, of course, as a doctor, he, he quickly realized that he didn't really have the capacity to be able to, to, uh, to heal a lot of, of injuries um, that the pioneers were, were uh, were getting or finding that they had, and uh, he was smart enough and open-minded enough uh, to consult the local indigenous peoples, and uh, by doing so, he discovered uh, 
uh, you know, and I wrote this uh, all about this in an article. He discovered uh, uh, local uh, cures, things oh. that the indigenous people had been using for you know probably a thousand years, um, and uh, so he decided that what he would do is he would compound them, and uh, he would then uh, uh, administer those to to the local population. And how long ago was that, Richard? Was that, was that the early Oh, we're talking, we're talking, he initially came here in the 1830s, mm -hmm. and uh, at that point I think he was a little elderly, but, um, you know, he was around for a while, and, and, and the key, I think, key part of the story, or the interesting part of the story, was in 1837, uh, of course we had the, the rebellion uh, mm -hmm. uh, here, and... Uh, he had some concerns about his safety because of the fact that he was uh, British, and so he was he was sort of pro family compact um, or the local government uh, at that time, and he was concerned that the the feeling here in, in Newmarket was very anti government, uh, and I guess he expressed those uh, feelings to his. Uh, uh, to the indigenous people, and uh, and they came and camped on his front lawn wow. uh, in full battle gear uh, <clears throat> to protect him. So I think that is, in itself, is kind of a, a, a cool thing. A little and, piece of history that Newmarket doesn't yeah. know. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of, you know, as we've talked over the, you know, the months about history, there's a lot of interesting stories that people don't know about because, you know, they, they don't teach them in school. Um, and again, going back to our, you know, we were talking about about conversations. People don't talk to each other anymore. You know, what's really sad is that uh, parents and grandparents, it appears, no longer uh, have conversations mm -hmm. with their their, uh, you know, with the younger people. And so the younger people have no way of of uh, learning about the interesting nuances of the community that they live in. Well, since we're on a radio station and we're surrounded by music. Another article that caught my eye that you wrote is about Teen Town, and I found it very fascinating how a lot of big big name artists actually came to this Teen Town. Well, you know, there's actually two stories in that. First of all, uh, Teen Town, which was, I guess, the New Market uh, uh, youth's efforts to actually create something of interest uh, for them to do uh, here in New Market, but also uh, as a coincidence, the uh, about the same time the uh, uh, they established a, a music circuit uh, out of Toronto, uh, which uh, visited all of the communities, uh, I guess as far north as, as Barrie. And uh, so, you know, these uh, people who were just starting their career, or early in their career, or maybe they wanted a boost in their career, would go on tour, and uh, Newmarket was one of the stops on the tour. Uh, I was fascinated about the story, uh, or I have been, fascinated about the story for quite a while because back when I was doing a, uh, a presentation and a, a series of, inter of uh, uh, articles about the, uh, I guess you'd say the cultural life of, of Newmarket, uh, I had made inquiries and I got a phone call one day from uh, uh, Bobby Crutola who asked if I uh, uh, understood that I was interested in uh, uh, in the stories about music from this area, and uh, so I spent probably about an hour and a half on the phone with him, and he talked about uh, you know singing in the area and some of the groups that sang in the area and some of the stories about uh, you know famous acts that that appeared here. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that T Town was a fascinating story, and and one you know Brad that I had uh, had to work on for all. Oh, uh, you know, four or five years. Usually, what I, I pride myself in in the articles is, you know, is getting the details down. And it always amazed me every time I would interview somebody. Uh, they all of a sudden were the center of the teen town experience. They organized it. They promoted it. You know, it was successful because of them. Well, you know, after about twenty people telling you that, you start to wonder. Gee, I wonder who actually did start it. So it took me a while to get, uh, you know, the story straightened out, and uh, so. But once I did, you know, I, I did a two-parter. The first part was basically the history of the uh, of Teen Town, how it came about, this sort of thing, the effect that it had on the town. And then the second one, uh, I invited people to to contact me with their memories. And 
I was very fortunate because a lot of local people contacted me with their memories, but also a lot of people in the music industry contacted me and told me interesting uh, stories and facts about uh, history in the area. You know, I, I probably have another article um, that I could write uh, on the Compass restaurant uh, where a number of acts uh, apparently used to use it uh, as a practice hall. Uh, I guess it was easy to get access and it was maybe a little cheaper. Um, if they were appearing in Toronto and they needed to rehearse, uh, they would come up to Newmarket and, uh, you know, and, uh, and practice. So, you know, uh, I think we have a, a fairly rich history. I also had, uh, um, you know, many of the people out there might remember uh, a duo um, called Gary and Dave. Uh, they Gary had, and Dave, uh, yeah. Yeah, they had uh, million sellers, as they yeah. pointed out to me in an interview uh, and corrected me. Uh, and brought me up to date, and uh, and they appeared here as a filler, what they call a filler mm -hmm. group. So they would play when the when the stars, I guess you'd say, uh, were taking a break. So uh, so they contacted me and told me their story, and uh, and we put it into the article. So you know, I I, I recommend uh, you know that people uh, read these articles. Obviously, because of time, we can't go through them point by point. But there's a lot of interesting stories. Well, the thing that also caught my eye and very interesting that you arrange walks during the year, and one of your recent walks was through a cemetery. Yes, in Newmarket. Well, the cemetery walks are always popular. There's there's two major elements. Uh, obviously, we take a look at the history of cemeteries here in Newmarket. We talk about you know the the cemeteries that have been paved over, um, uh, but we also talk about the history of the uh, of the uh, the the Catholic and the Protestant cemetery on North Main, uh, and then the second uh, thing that we do in the cemeteries is we I do a presentation on tombstones, the secret language of tombstones, oh. and we talk about uh, uh, you know all of the the things that are on tombstones that people don't notice, um, they just think that they're cute designs, but they actually mean something, uh, and we uh, also take a look at uh, uh, some of the famous and semi-famous people who are buried. Uh, in Newmarket. How was the turnout for that? Well, uh, we did one on uh, uh, this week and it was a, it was a little cold. Uh, doing the uh, the walks in the winter time, I usually am quite happy if I get 10 people. Um, it's not a bad turnout considering the, you know, if the elements are bad. Considering the weather and, uh, but uh, you know, I would think that probably in any given year we probably do this tour maybe 20 times. Wow. So, we do do it in the, uh, when it's warm as well. And really, I looked at your walk in from the cold. Yes. And that's, is that coming up soon? Yes, uh, 25th of February. Um, I'm always excited about doing it. We've been doing it, oh, I guess for five or six years. Um, essentially what it is, is that uh, that first year uh, that I walked uh, for the charity in from the cold, uh, there's a mass of people walking. I noticed that people weren't really talking to each other unless, you know, they were families walking. And I thought to myself, you know, it'd be really interesting if, uh, you know, if I did something that was customized. So, you know, I, I, a history walk and uh, we could raise money for charity. And, uh, you know, thankfully it's been very successful. I would say probably over the five or six years we've raised, oh, quite likely close to $10,000. Wow. Um, and uh, this year, uh, the chosen to topic is uh, Newmarket's uh, uh, World War II military camp. So we're going to walk uh, the grounds. We're going to take a look at the houses that were converted uh, from barracks into to, to houses. We're going to take a look at uh, a little bit uh, about the uh, Newmarket's first, we talked about this before in a previous interview, Newmarket's first subdivision, Connaught mm -hmm. Gardens, uh, because the military camp encompassed uh, that uh, land um, and we'll talk about uh, Newmarket's contribution to the Second World War. Uh, so I think it should be really interesting. Uh, how do people um, join us? Uh, I have, uh, you know, in all the social uh, uh, media outlets, I, I have mm -hmm. posted the, uh, the link. Um, what you need to do is you need to go to uh, In From The Cold and, uh, and register. Um, I believe the minimum uh, donation to them is $25 and for $25 you get uh, to go on the walk with this. So you'll get a handout. Um, 
So it's usually, you know, it's usually quite exciting. Uh, in previous years, we've done uh, Main Street in the 1950s. We did, uh, we did uh, uh, hotels and taverns of, of, of Newmarket, which was a real winner. A lot of people would like to see me do that again. Um, we've done a lot of really interesting things. We've done uh, a walk of neighborhoods and take, uh, and we took a look at uh, old houses. So you know, we've done a lot of interesting things under the, you know, the, the banner of, uh, of uh, the history Allen presents. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, and as they say, we raise money for and from Nicole, which I think is the, the really important uh, thing that we do. So when is your next your next walk? Is it in February? No, we have a we're going to be doing a walk of uh, Newmarket schools, um, as well. Uh, we're going to be doing a a walk, and this is the first time that we've done this, but I'm I'm hoping it will be successful. We're going to do a walk of Newmarket's old churches. So basically, it's going to be kind of exciting. We we're going to do a, uh, a walk, and we're going to take a look at uh, the history or the uh, of the uh, particular religious uh, uh, groups in Newmarket. And then uh, the second part of the walk is that we will actually go uh, to the church and the, uh, the, uh, the church elders will do a tour of their church um, and talk a little bit about the history of their church. Um, so far we have four churches that have signed up. We have Trinity United, we have uh, the Christian Baptist Church uh, on the hill on Main Street. We have uh, St. Paul's Church, and we have St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, some of the other local churches will sign up, and, uh, and we'll be able to take a look at their, uh, their history as well. In one of the 100-year-old schools is a school called Stuart Scott. Yes. 100 years a, old. A, a reunion, yes. And it's, a, it's the, uh, the oldest church, or oldest church, oldest school left uh, in Newmarket. Uh, what's interesting about Stuart Scott, quite apart from the fact that you know that I went there, so uh, therefore it's famous. Uh, ha ha. But the uh, the other thing I think is interesting is that uh, Stuart Scott, the King George, and the uh, Alexander Muir uh, all were built on the same plans. Uh, the gentleman who built uh, all three schools uh, purchased the the plans from the from the government. So they, uh, they were exactly the same plan. Uh, so I, it's kind of interesting. I'm involved in, uh, in sort of the historical side of the reunion. So we're busy uh, trying to raise money to, uh, to pay for the facilities. Uh, that takes place on the 10th of June uh, this year. So we're hoping that lots of people will come back um, to celebrate uh, you know, the school and having gone there. And uh, of course, anybody can attend, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we'll all be involved in doing two things. First of all, I'll do a presentation on the history of the school, but second of all, and I think more uh, more exciting, I guess you would say, is that I'm going to, uh, to set up in a room, and uh, I'm going to do what you're doing now to me, which is to <laughs> interview people uh, as they come back and give people an opportunity to record their memories of having attended uh, Stuart Scott School. Um, sort of a, a glorified oral history uh, experience. What a great idea, and hats off to you for arranging this thing with the Stuart, School, Stuart Scott School. Yeah, uh, hopefully it's ex exciting. I like to get involved in, in projects like this. Uh, you know, these things, these sort of experiences need to be nurtured. We have too few, too few of them, uh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I would suggest that, you know, in everyday life we've pretty much forgotten a lot of the really cool things about this town and uh, so I think that it's always a good idea to celebrate it and uh, if you can have a little party, hey, so much the better. Well, we're just about out of time and the, the interview went really fast as usual, Richard. Um, how can the people get a hold of you to sign up to any of your walks or just find out what the History Hound is all about? Well, I, I post the, uh, the, events, the events on, uh, you know, on the usual places, history, uh, on the History Hound uh, uh, channel, on YouTube, on uh, Facebook, on uh, Twitter, these sort of things. Uh, I have a mailing list uh, that I use, so if you've been on a, a previous uh, walk, uh, you will get a notification of, of what is coming up. Uh, people can always get a hold of me uh, by emailing me at uh, 
thehistoryhound at rogers.com. Um, and if you're interested in, uh, you know, every day uh, I post new information to Facebook. Again, you just look at the, for the History Hound on Facebook, uh, face, Facebook group, and, uh, you know, you can learn all kinds of interesting facts about Newmarket. Well, it's great having you on the show. We hope to get you on a further edition of Out and About Town sometime around February. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you. You're listening to the Out and About Town show on Chop FM 102.7. A very special shout out to our producer, Garrett Stirrup. Thanks a lot for listening.